Hi, fellow believers in Christ. I just wanted to tell you today that faith is a decision. Um, uh, we hear a lot about how we need more faith and, um, you know, some people get healed from the Lord and they talk about them or others talk about their faith and it, but it seems kind of mysterious at times. Well, where does faith come from? How do you get it? How can you have enough faith to get healed or enough faith to see any kind of miracle in your life? Um, where does it come from? You know, are some people just better than others because they can have more faith? Is it a spiritual gift or what? And um, I think sometimes it can be a spiritual gift because there's been times more in my life where it seemed like faith entered into me, you know, from the Lord. It's like the faith, faith from, from God entered into me and then I, then I acted on it. And there's other times where my faith seemed really quiet and silent, but it was, it was sure. And I, and I saw outcome and, um, there's been times where I spoke, you know, I, I, in all the cases I believed, of course, and people say, oh, you just need to believe, you just need to believe, you just need to believe. But how do you believe? You know, if, if you're facing something that's an obstacle that you've prayed for years about and you've never overcome it yet, how do you believe? Because it's almost like in our earthly mind, if you keep praying for something and you don't see a result, if anything, that would discourage your faith, you know, in the carnal mind. Um, so, and, and I've been accused before of not having faith when I knew I had a lot of faith. I had the belief, the belief was pretty high because, and, and a lot of people, you know, people will question, do you really believe God can heal you? But the person's coming up for prayer to get healed. If they didn't believe, why would they even be there? You know what I mean? And and I've heard people say, well, that's why I'm here, you know? And, and, I, and um, I remember one time I was at a church and we had all gathered specifically for me to get prayed for, me and some, some uh, Christian friends. And we were waiting for a pastor to call, call us on the phone who was gonna pray with us over the phone because because he couldn't be there and while we were waiting I was just waiting happily waiting because I believed the Lord was going to answer my prayer and um and I was just sitting there just waiting for the phone call because I knew you know people have busy schedules all kinds of reasons could cause somebody not to call on time he ended up calling us like at least half an hour late somewhere between 20 minutes and 40 minutes but I think it was closer to 40 minutes late something like that when he finally called I didn't have a problem with that because um, I didn't know what his schedule was. I I knew he was going to call. If he's a little bit late, something must have come up, right? Maybe he was praying with somebody else. I, I just, it didn't bother me. But while we were waiting, two of the other women who were waiting with us kept bothering me, kept like harassing me almost saying that I needed to have stronger faith. And I, I'm like, women, I have faith. I mean, we wouldn't be here if I didn't believe. Just just calm down. They were like getting anxious and upset because the pastor hadn't called. And they were like projecting it onto me and trying to make me feel as if I was the one anxious and upset. And I wasn't. I didn't have any. Pr I knew he was going to call. You know, I just knew he was going to call. And, um, and, and I knew that Jesus would be there when he called. But I got angry with these ladies because they were trying to, they were accusing me of losing faith because the call hadn't come through yet. But I felt that they were the ones losing faith and they were just trying to project it onto me because I wasn't saying anything. I didn't have a problem. I was just sitting there calmly waiting and praying to the Lord. And what, and they kept interrupting my prayers, telling me that, that I needed to be strong. And it's like, be quiet you be strong you know <laughs> anyway by the time he by the time he called I was so irritated and angry with those ladies that I think it was a distraction at that point and Jesus did touch me I didn't get the healing that that we had all been waiting for and wanting to pray for I did get touched by the Lord I had a um how should you put it um an encounter with Jesus, like a 
a supernatural encounter. Now, I'm not trying to say that if you don't never, I mean, there's a, probably millions of Christians who lived their whole life, served the Lord, loved him, never had a supernatural encounter, and they're in heaven right now. <laughs> so none of us need to see Jesus or feel Jesus or touch Jesus in a concrete way. We just need to obey as the Lord has told us to obey. He didn't say, I command you to have a vision of me, or I command you to have some sort of supernatural encounter with me. He only commanded us to obey. So we should never feel awful if we're in that place where we've never had a, had an encounter that was like really amazing. This was the only time that I think of that I had an encounter with Jesus. And since then, I've come to realize, because I did want to have an encounter with Jesus, but since then, I've come to realize that having an encounter with Jesus is not a measure of your faith. It's not a measure of how much God loves you. It's not a measure of how much you're serving the Lord. And it's not a measure of whether or not you're saved. Um, because there's plenty of people who have had encounters, and I've heard their testimonies, and, and they went straight back into sin. So um, it's just that God is good, and sometimes he, he manifests in a physical way to people. And it, but if he doesn't, that in no way means that there's anything wrong with your faith. Well, anyway, I didn't get my prayer answered that day, but I did have an encounter with Jesus. I didn't see him, but I knew where he was standing. And the pastor on the phone said, he's standing in front of you slightly to your left, which is what I already knew. And that was a confirmation because, because I, I already knew he was there, even though I couldn't, couldn't see him. And then he, and then um, the pastor said, well, he's touching your head, the, like the crown of your head. And at that point, he, I did feel a real severe, definite um, physical sensation on the crown of my head. It didn't really feel like a human hand touching my head, though. I was a little disappointed by that. <laughs> but it felt like something was on the crown of my head. It was like a tingly, um, I wouldn't exactly say warm, but kind of a tingly feeling on the crown. And it wasn't a slight tingle. This was like a massive concrete feeling. This wasn't something like I felt a little rustle of wind and then I thought that was Jesus. No, this was, and it was also um, a spreading feeling. Like I say, I wouldn't exactly say it was warm, but warm is the only word I can give to it that's similar to how it felt because it felt like it was spreading from the crown of my head, spreading down a little bit, kind of like the way warm water would feel, but it was a tingly feeling. Um, it's really hard to describe, but um, but but it was it was concrete. It was, and it wasn't so slight that that you know I might have imagined it. I did not imagine it. It was a concrete, like a. This might sound weird, but almost like a oozing feeling, like it was on the crown of my head, and it oozed a little bit out from there. I'm not sure if it went down or out, but. That's the only way I can describe it. So anyway, Jesus did touch the crown of my head. I know he did. Um, it didn't feel like a man's hand touching my head, though. But I kind of wish it did. <laughs> I wish that it did. But um, but it was um, something I warm is the only word I can use to describe it. But it, I wouldn't. I don't think it was really warm. I, but it was like something like that. Because you know how warmth kind of spreads. That's what I'm getting at. Whatever it was, the feeling I had on my head, it was spreading. That's all I can say. Well, anyhow, so, um, so, so, but I, I kind of felt after that, and now I don't really feel that way anymore, but I kind of felt for a while after that, that those women kind of were destroying the faith I had before the phone call. It was like, I was ready, you know, I was ready to get healed. But they kept nagging me the whole 40 minutes. And it's like, leave me alone. And they nagged me so much that they did distract my faith. I wanted to spend that time in quiet prayer, you know, like everybody else was doing. I didn't want to spend that time 
being nagged and accused of not having faith. So anyway, by the time the pastor called, I think, I think my faith was a little bit off. But who knows? I don't really know. There's so many things about salvation and God and faith that are unexplainable that I, I don't understand and I don't I'll probably never understand until I get to heaven. So I don't really know why I wasn't healed that day and why I'm still not healed today of the same of the same things. Um, but anyway, I did want to talk about one thing I do know about faith is it is a decision. That's the way I could describe it the best to you is that faith is a decision. That's what I've come to learn. Um, and even if even if it's kind of gifted to you in a moment, which it has been to me before, it's still ultimately a decision that you are determined to, that, that this is what you know is true and you're going to act on it. So when I first learned that Jesus is God when I was four years old, I, I made a decision to believe that. And I believed it with all my heart. I never stopped believing that. I've, I, I never stopped believing that. And when I finally learned, well, well I'll, sh I'll just say at the age of 43 was when I made a decision to believe that my flesh could be crucified and that I could have victory over sin because of Jesus Christ being alive inside of me. I finally made a decision that if I didn't repent, I would go to hell. And, and it, my faith was a decision. I wanted to share some other, um, maybe this will make it make more sense, but some stories from when I was young, before I became born again, but I was a Christian. I remember in high school, I had made a decision one, one year, and I think it was, I think it was my junior, junior or senior year in high school. I made a decision one year that I was, that my mom was going to give me a box of Valentine's candy on Valentine's Day. I wanted a box of chocolates, the heart-shaped box of chocolates, and a big one, not a little one. I wanted a big box of heart-shaped chocolates, or at least medium size, you know what I mean, on Valentine's Day. And one year, I think it was my junior year, I made a decision that my mom was going to get me that. Now, up to that point in my life, I never really asked my mom for anything. I just took it as an assumption. Well, there were a few times I asked, but I was always told no, you know, and I, I pretty much never got anything I wanted. And I rarely ever asked because I knew the answer was going to be no. But the answer was always, you can't because you're a girl or I have no, no money. And that's what I was told my whole life on the few times that I asked for things. I only asked if I was desperate because I, I always knew it was going to be no. So most of the time, generally speaking, I didn't ask. And um, and so anyway, I just grew up never never asking for stuff and never getting anything, pretty much. All my clothes were hand-me-downs and all this kind of stuff. Well, almost all of them. But anyway, um, one day I made or one year I made a decision that my mom was going to get me a box of chocolates. <laughs> And so for about two weeks, it was either a week and a half or two weeks, I would come home every day after school and I would see my mom somewhere at some point in the day, whether it was in the morning or in the evening in the living room or something. And I would say, Mom, I want a box of chocolate on a box of chocolate on Valentine's Day. And and that was it. And I would just look at her and I was determined and I was so confident. This is the only time I was ever conf like the most confident I ever was in my whole growing up years. I, I would tell her with confidence and a slight smile on my face because I was so confident. Mom, you're going to get me a box of chocolates on Valentine's Day. I told her that every day for I think it was a week and a half. And um, on Valentine's Day, I came home from school and <laughs> I walked in the door and my mom was sitting there on the couch in the living room and, and we both locked eyes. And I put my hands on my hips and I looked at her like she was in trouble, but it was a, in a joking way, you know, not seriously in trouble. But I, but I gave her that look like, you know what, you know, it's, it's, 
what's the word for it? It's it's like, um, I don't know what, I forgot the expression, but anyway, um, you have to come through. And so then without saying a word, I marched to my room and I put my, my stuff, my coat and whatever down, my coat and my books. And then I marched back out to the living room and I looked at her again. And this time I spoke, I said, where's my chocolate? And my mom was kind of half laughing, but she was also like, what? You didn't see it? it? It's in your room. And so I was so determined to get that chocolate that I never saw the chocolate. So then I laughed. I went back to my room and sure enough, there it was on my dresser. I was so determined that I had to tell her to get it to me. I, I almost half thought in my mind that she was going to take me out at that point to the grocery store and go buy me the chocolate. But she had already taken care of it because for that whole week and a half, I had told her every day that that was her job, her one job. She had to get me chocolate. Anyway, there it was, my box of chocolates. And so then I came out and we were laughing and stuff. And I thought, and I said, I, I was so determined to get chocolate from you. I didn't even see it. And that was a fun memory when I was young and it, and I made a decision you see in that situation I made a decision that my mom was going to get me that box of chocolates I knew she could do it I knew she was capable of it I knew she had the money I knew she had the time and um see all the other years when I was growing up no one got chocolate on valentine's but my big sister because her her birthday was on valent was very close to valentine's day so every birthday, she got a massive box of chocolates and nobody else did because it was her birthday. So, so I understand why my mom did that. But this year, which I think was my junior year, she was out of the house. And that was why I determined and I, may, and I said, this is my year. She's not even here. I'm getting that box of chocolates. And so that was what it was all about. Because all those years I wanted that box of chocolates or, or at least a small one. But, it, but we never got it because it would it would defile her birthday. So anyway, so so I had made a decision that, that my mom was going to do it. I knew she was capable. And I think faith is that way, too. We make a decision that we know God's going to do it. We know he's capable. We know he we know there's no reason why he wouldn't do it. And so we make a decision that that's what we expect and that's what we're going to get. And another, I'll give you another example uh, from my youth. At one point, um, I had a, I always had a hard time getting jobs when I was young. Once I got hired, they liked me and they would never fire me. They, they always liked me because I was a hard worker. But I had a hard time getting employment because I have a deformity. My, my right arm is deformed and people would just look at it and be like, we don't need you. Like they would just instantly write me off thinking that I can't do anything. And I remember one time in particular um, when I was in high school, uh, it was Burger King was advertising openings. And they're always, even if they're not advertising, they always have openings. And all places like that will always let you take pick up an application and turn it in even when they aren't hiring. They'll let you turn in an application because... They know in two weeks they'll be hiring again. You know what I mean? So they, they had advertised they had openings that day. I walked in and I said, can I get an application? The lady looked at my arm and said, we're not hiring. She lied. She completely lied. I had this trouble a lot. Like, this is why, uh, well, anyway, to make a long story short, <laughs> I'll get back to the point. So I always had trouble getting employment. And I always felt like people just could never believe that I could do anything. And when I was about 19 years old, um, I had moved to California and I, I went to secretarial school for a year. Then I moved to California and I moved in with my sister and brother-in-law and I started immediately looking for employment. But I, I, my, I, I typed, but since I typed with one hand, I was a little bit slow. And so I could never get a, a secretarial job in that town because most people, most secretaries can type a minimum of 70 words per minute, at least back then. But I could only type 40 because I typed with one hand. 
So every time I applied for a job, I couldn't get it because they, there's a, tons of people out there who could do 70 words a minute. So what would they want me for? You know what I mean? So they never considered me. So after six months of trying to get a secretarial job, one day I said, I'm done. I am done. I am going to get a job. I, I don't care what it is. I don't care where it is. The only stipulation is it had to be within walking distance because I didn't have a car. So it had to be within walking distance of where I lived. And the only, the, the closest places that you could get a job where I live within walking distance, it was only like a mile and a mile away, or actually it was like three fourths of a mile of walk, was at this mall. There is a mall about a three fourths of a mile from where I lived. So I thought, that's it. I am making a decision. I'm going to go to that mall. I'm going to get a job today. I'm not looking for secretarial jobs anymore. I am getting a job today. I am done being unemployed. And the whole time, the whole six months, I wanted a job, but but I had it. But I felt like I had to get a secretarial job because that's what I was uh, trained to do. But this time I said, I am getting any job, but I'm getting it today. So I marched to the mall. I, and I'm seriously, I marched to the mall. I was so determined and so mad. I was mad. And um, so, so I, I scoped the mall out and the best looking place was JCPenney. And because it was on the side of the mall that was quicker to get to, and it was the biggest department store on that side of the mall. So I'm like, oh yeah, they got jobs there. So I marched in there and I, and I said, I want a job. And I didn't even say, are you hiring? I didn't say, can I have an application? I said, I want a job. And they gave me the application. I stayed there and filled it out. Then they said, well, you have to take a test. So I took the test. And then I turned all my stuff in. And I'm like, when will I get an interview? I wasn't, I wasn't even, I wasn't being sheepish at all. I'm like, now, now, now. When will I get an interview? She, so she said, well, in a few days, blah, blah, blah. You know, we just have to get your test results and then we'll call you. And she said, when we call you, you don't have to show up. If you don't show up, then we'll know you don't want the job. And I said, I am going to be there. <laughs> so I got, I'm like, I'm showing up. And then, so a couple of days later, they called me for an interview. And during the interview, the lady said, well, you didn't score very high on the test. And so, you know, if you don't want the job, it's okay. And I said, I want this job. I am, I am going to take this job. Because she wasn't telling me I couldn't have the job. She was only telling me, she was doing everything she could to talk me out of it. But she never said she wouldn't hire me. So I kept telling her, I want the job. I want it now. And she said, okay, okay, okay. So we'll go ahead and hire you, you know, technically, like we'll do all the paperwork. But if you don't show up for training on the first day, then I'll know you don't really want the job and everything's fine. I'll just, you know, scratch you off the list. So you don't have to, you don't have to show up if you don't want to. And I said, I will be there. And I, and I said, I want this job. I'm coming to training. And so whenever uh, the training was a couple of days later or whatever it was, I went to training. And from that point on, I was their employee and I stayed there for a while. But anyhow, the point is when I got that job, I had made a decision that they were going to hire me, that I was going to get the job. I knew in my mind there's no reason why I couldn't do the work. There's no reason why they shouldn't hire me because I knew places like that have a lot of turnover. I knew they would need me. And and also, I didn't really believe her when she said that I had a low score on the, um, on the exam because when I took the exam, I felt like it was third grade level work, like plus, minus, subtract, you know, and it was so easy. And it was like so, so, so third grade level that I felt when I was taking it that I was totally acing it. I didn't even think it was high school, a high school level test. And so when she said that, I didn't want to be disrespectful and tell her she was lying. But I really thought there was a good chance she was lying, that they, they, she just didn't want me, maybe because of my short arm again, because it's a department store and you have to look good. And so maybe she didn't like the way my arm looked. And so she was trying to lie to me and talk me out of it. But she couldn't legally, she couldn't legally not hire me. And so maybe that's what the situation was looking back. But I, I couldn't figure out, 
I almost wanted to say, show me the test, show me my test paper, because I couldn't believe that I could have failed that test because it was so third grade. And I knew I was way smarter than that. And I was answering the questions, boom, boom, boom. You know, they were the easiest thing in the world. And um, so, so maybe she just didn't like my arm either. And she was just trying to talk me out of it because she, because she didn't want me as an employee, but she couldn't really say no. <laughs> but I had, I, I had already decided I was going to have that job before I marched to the mall that day. Like when I left my house, I was like, I am getting a job today. That's it. So, and that's another case where I made a decision and, and I had all the faith in the world that that job was mine because I made a decision that that job was mine. You see what I'm saying? So that's how I got the Valentine's candy. That's how I got that job at JCPenney was I made a decision ahead of time that it was mine. And um, then, you know, I've told you this story before about how um, there, I when I was, um, in college many years later i was in college and i was in a library and there and i was in a study room and next door to me in the next study room was this witch who was gonna have people pray with her to evil spirits and and what the first thought that came in my mind was not on my watch and and i heard i could overhear them because the walls were really thin or because the holy spirit allowed me to hear when I shouldn't have been able to, I don't know, but I could hear them crystal clear everything that they were saying and they were going to pray to demons. And so I just said, not on my watch. Cause I was a Christian. I wasn't born again, but I was a Christian. And I was like almost gloating and laughing because I knew they wanted not be able to pray to those demons. And so I prayed and miraculously that meeting was split up within a couple of minutes. Everybody left in basically terror out of that room and they never prayed to those demons and um but i then again was another case where i made a, a decision that there's no way that jesus would let them pray to those demons that his power was greater than that witch's influence and that witch's power and that her her measly piddly power was going to be trampled all over by the lord and i made a decision that that's what was going to happen before I started praying. I knew the outcome before I even began praying. And I was smiling. I remember I was smiling because I was so confident and so sure. Just like when I smiled at my mom every day when I told her, you're getting me a box of chocolates on Valentine's Day. And, you know, heart-shaped box of chocolates. And I had that smile because I was so confident. I knew she was going to do it. And um, so anyway, that's another example where I made a decision. And then I remember, um, I'll kind of skip to another one. When I got uh, healed from acne, I had acne my entire adult life. And after I became born again at the age of 43, now my skin looked pretty good almost all those years. Most of the people, especially um, from the time where I was about 35 um, between 35 and 43, when I finally got healed of acne, no one would ever believe I had acne. It looked the way it does now, but I had to treat it every day for it to look clear. I couldn't just, you know, be normal and have clear skin. I had to treat it every single night and morning. And I got, I was so exhausted of treating my face all the time. And so after I became born again, one day I decided I'm not doing this anymore. Jesus has healed my acne. Um, you know, he took he took the stripes so that I could be healed. And I'm exhausted of doing all these facial treatments. I'm not going to do it anymore. And I went to the mirror and I looked in the mirror and I said, acne in the name of Jesus Christ, you have to go now. You don't have a leg to stand on. It's over. You have to leave me now. And I got instantly healed of acne. That night, I did not do my facial treatment. I didn't do it the next, well, I usually did it at night anyway. Um, so I didn't do my facial treatment that night. And the next morning, I went to school and I told my students that Jesus had healed my acne, even though there was no proof yet. 
because it hadn't been long enough for me to break out. And then I um, told, and then I called my mom that night and I told her that Jesus had healed my acne and it still didn't really have any proof because you can't tell in one day if you're really, you know, if your pimples are going to come back or not, that's not long enough. But sure enough, I was healed. And that night when I looked in the mirror and I was just like, uh, it was, it was the same feeling I had, except not quite as intense is when I got that job at JCPenney. It was like, I'm getting this today. I'm not waiting any longer. And my waiting is over. And the same thing with the acne. I was like, I'm going to be healed right now, tonight. I will not hope anymore. I'm going to be healed. That's it. And so I made a decision that I was going to be healed that night. And I was because the breakouts never came back. Now, occasionally, if I eat loads and loads of junk food and don't drink any water, I'll have a few pimples. But that's what e would happen to anybody. That's not acne. That's just, you know, a bad, you know, that's a normal reaction to junk food. As soon as I stop eating the junk food and drink water, I'm fine again. My face goes back. And so I never have any kind of bad breakout. And it's always, I mean, I have to eat a lot of candy bars, you know, and cake and stuff before I have a pimple. And then as soon as I stop and I just, you know, drink water for a day, they're all gone. So I don't have acne. Um, anybody can have pimples if they don't take care of themselves, but I do not have acne. Acne is when you break out every single day for no reason. When you're doing, when you're eating right, you're doing everything you can to take care of your face and you just continuously break out for no reason at all. So I don't, I got healed that very night. And, and my face looks as good as it did then, but I don't do the treatments anymore. I still wash my skin properly, and that's it. That's basically it, you know. So, again, that's another situation where I just made a decision. And this is what I'm finding with faith is it's when you make a decision that this can, can you can have this, and you will have it. Because you can, because it's reasonable um, under the promises of the Lord. It falls within those promises. It's 100% reasonable, and God is 100% capable of delivering it. And so in order to get more healing in my life, I have to make come to a decision with everything. And recently when I got healed, I got serious emotional healing from people falsely accusing me. It was because... In, 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 in part, I came to a decision that that wasn't going to happen to me anymore, that I was going to get deliverance from it. And it's beautiful because now I, have, I can love people so much better. Um, I'm not getting caught up in, in gossip a little bit because I have a friend at work who <laughs> she always says, she always says, I always tell you everything, but only a gossip would say that. And the truth is, I do get caught up listening to her her gossip because I love her. She loves me. We understand each other. We're close because we're in the same age because we work with a lot of young people and her and I are about the same age. So we understand each other. And the other, the other people we work with are from younger generations and they don't get us at all. So we have a close relationship, but because of that gossip has seeped in not, not malicious gossip, but where we're saying like, Oh, yeah, if only they understood. Yeah, yeah, they do this wrong. They do that wrong. If only they were like us, the world would be perfect. It's that kind of thing. But it's still gossip. And But now I really have faith because I know how to love people better that I don't have to get frustrated with what's going on with people because it isn't like they're them against me. It's, it's, um, it's just Satan and he's the enemy. And the people, I don't have to worry about them. All I have to do is love people. I need to just love, love, love and treat them with lots of respect. And so I don't have to worry if they do something wrong. And today I had had an opportunity to vent and complain. And I didn't because of faith, because I'm delivered, you know. And so it was really neat. So when I was talking to my boss about a certain situation that, that needed to be dealt with, it wasn't with any any stress or um, how should I put it? Uh, I wasn't irritated at all or concerned or afraid. I just simply said, this is the situation. And, you know, this is 
you know, you know, what I think we should do, but, you know, I didn't worry about it and it was really awesome. And then my boss dealt with it and the lady involved in the situation, I don't have any hard feelings about her at all or anything. It's just so neat how I'm free from stress, free from strife, free from judging myself and comparing myself to others, free from judging others and comparing them to me or to each other. That uh, the whole thing, uh, the deliverance I got with getting deliverance from having false accusations, it kind of came with another deliverance of not comparing myself to others and not comparing others to me or to each other and, and not therefore not critiquing or criticizing people. So when I went to my boss today about a situation, it wasn't in critique or criticizing. And, um, and also I've noticed in the last few days that I haven't got caught up in any gossip situations or scenarios. I've been really, really free to not be involved in that with my good friend. So, and I'm, I'm really conscious of it now. So, um, anyway, it just makes me feel really good, but it's because I came to a decision that I can be free from that junk, free from false accusations, free from judgment coming from me or at me, um, free from tension and being afraid of people because they always did it this way and therefore or they'll just keep doing it. I don't believe that about people anymore. Just because they did it 20 times in the past doesn't mean they're going to do it today or tomorrow because today and tomorrow I'm delivered. <laughs> that when they did that stuff in the past, I wasn't delivered yet. So everything's different now. So I don't expect the past anymore. I'm done expecting the past. It's over because I'm delivered. I'm a new person. And um, so anyway, and because I'm a new person, I can treat them as if they are new as well. And in my mind, it's like they are it's just really beautiful. But I hope that ministered you somehow. Um, and even when we crucify the flesh, you know, when I when I made that, that when I came to that decision that my flesh could be crucified, that's what got it crucified but it has it's a daily thing you don't just crucify it once and you're done you have to crucify it every hour sometimes every minute and i have failed many many times um but i but i do know that it's through faith it's an act of faith and it can be done it can be done i just have to make it make a decision make a decision that jesus is here alive inside of me and my flesh is dead and it's reasonable because God can do it. He's got the power to do it. He wants to do it. He's promised it. I've seen it done before and I can see it done again, you know, because there's been times in the past where I, where my flesh is crucified. I'll see it again. All I have to do is make a decision to believe and then it's done. And you don't have to see yourself as somebody addicted to porn or addicted to jelly beans because if you make a decision that your flesh is crucified and jesus is alive in you you will act and look and feel different you will be a different person because you'll have jesus in you and his personality will shine it shine shine out from you and you will be different and it, it doesn't take any time in a moment in a twinkling of an eye you can come to that decision and experience that new that that new reality and it's just um it's just a decision but if you stay in the old way of thinking where i can never get over this i this always happens to me it's it here they come again oh there they do it again you know when we're in that mind frame of that decision making then we don't see any miracles so anyway hope that encouraged you and um i'm definitely going to be thinking about my decisions a lot more now. God bless you.